Hi, this is Ajahn Achalo. Just wanted to give a brief introduction to this talk. So I'm happy to share with you another talk in the series of the talks that I gave while leading a pilgrimage to the Buddhist holy sites in northern India. This talk is actually a reading which I read in the Jetavana in Sarvati. The Jetavana was offered to Lord Buddha and his order by Anattapindika. It was the pleasure grove of Prince Jeta, and Prince Jeta also offered a portion. So it was known as Jetavana, and Lord Buddha spent, I think it was 18 or 19 rainy season retreats in that very place. So going and recollecting many of the wonderful teachings that were taught there, most of the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya, for instance, begin with the phrase, Thus have I heard, once the Buddha was staying at Savati, residing in the Jeta's Grove, Anattapindika's Park, and then we have the body of the sutta. So thousands of liberating teachings and tens of thousands, or possibly hundreds of thousands of people attained to deep spiritual insight. Many of them would have become enlightened or liberated from delusion in that very space. So going and studying, meditating, contemplating, recollecting these things, in uh, such an ancient place steeped in wisdom and purity for so long is a very powerful, wonderful experience. So the particular sutta that I'm reading from is when the Buddha is already in old age, 80 years old, he's visited by the king, King Pasenadi, when he's also 80 years old. And the king, in a very moving gesture, is incredibly respectful and affectionate, actually bows down and strokes and kisses the feet of Lord Buddha. And Lord Buddha, taken aback, asks, King Pasenadi, why are you showing such humility and affection? And then the king explains how he's come to develop such faith and confidence in the Lord Buddha and his teachings and his community according to his own observations. So it's very moving and one gets a very good sense of the Buddha's incredible skill at teaching and the impeccability of his conduct, his capacity to train and establish an order which is inspiring for those who have faith and uh, gives rise to faith in those who don't. So it's a wonderful way to get a bit of a review about what the result of the Buddha's life was. Uh, by a king who lived in that area where the Buddha's main monastery was. So I'm quite sure that you will find this sutta reading and commentary moving, just like I did, and the group that I was traveling with. At the end of this fairly short talk, there's also a little ceremony that I led, where people are formally expressing their respect and their gratitude, and uh, asking for forgiveness and then setting aspiration to continue to meet liberating teachings and to be enlightened. So feel free to join in the spirit of that uh, inspired occasion. I hope that something here is useful to you, wherever you are now. So in considering what to talk about here in Savati, there were so many wonderful teachings offered, and there are so many wonderful characters, it's hard to know where to begin. Usually people begin with the Anattapindika first meeting the Buddha, becoming very inspired and uh, intending to find a place to accommodate the Buddha here in Savati. So Anattapindika was a very wealthy and extremely generous person. He was famous for giving to the poor and to giving to people from all religious sects without bias, extremely generous philanthropist. But I thought rather than begin with the beginning, I might read something that occurred later on, because it gives a lovely glimpse of what had occurred here in this area. So as I mentioned earlier, in the Majjhima Nikaya, most of the suttas in that whole collection of suttas begin with, Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was staying at Savati, residing at the Jeta's Grove, and Anattapindika's Park. So that's where we are now. It's our very good fortune that we can come here and soak up the blessings. The sutra I'm going to read is, uh, is very touching. It's when the king, Pasenadi, goes and pays respects to Lord Buddha in a very intimate and warm way. 
at the ripe old age of 80. And Lord Buddha is also 80 in this exchange. And the Buddha asked him, what are you, why are you being so affectionate and so respectful, great king? And then the king actually explains the various reasons that he's come to have such great faith in Lord Buddha. Which is very, uh, kings are famous for being somewhat proud and for having wars and things like that. So for a king to be literally kissing Lord Buddha's feet actually with gratitude and love and faith and devotion. And then he explains to him why he's developed this faith and devotion. It's very beautiful. So I'll start with that. Just to mention before reading the sutta that at first King Pusenadi didn't have faith in Lord Buddha. It was Anattapindika who had faith first and then later uh, King Pusenadi developed faith through his wife actually. His wife developed faith in Lord Buddha before Queen Malika developed faith in Lord Buddha before the king did. But as we'll see, he did develop great faith. So the sutra is called Dhamma Chetia Sutta, Monuments to the Dhamma. On this occasion, the Buddha wasn't in Savati, but the king of Kosala, whose capital city was Savati, is featured in this sutta. And thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country where there was a town of the Sakyans named Medalumpa. Now on that occasion, King Pasenadi of Kosala had arrived at Nagaraka for some business or other. Then he addressed Diga Karayana, Dear Karayana, have the state carriages prepared, let us go to the pleasure garden to a pleasing spot. Yes, sire, Diga Karayana replied. When the state carriages were prepared, he informed the king, sire, the state carriages are ready for you, you may go at your convenience. Then King Pasenadi mounted a state carriage and accompanied by the other carriages, he drove out from Nagaraka with the full pomp of royalty and proceeded towards the park. He went thus as far as the road was passable for carriages and then dismounted from his carriage and entered the park on foot. As he walked and wandered in the park for exercise, King Pasenadi saw roots of trees that were lovely and inspiring, quiet and undisturbed by voices with an atmosphere of seclusion, remote from people, favorable for retreat. The sight of these reminded him of the Blessed One thus. These roots of trees are lovely and inspiring, quiet and undisturbed by voices, with an atmosphere of seclusion, remote from people, favorable for retreat, like the places where we used to pay respect to the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. Then he told Diga Karayana what he had thought and asked, Where is he living now, the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened? There is Saya, a town of the Sakyans named Medalumpa. The Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, is now living there. How far is it from Nagaraka to Medalumpa? It is not far, Saya, three leagues. There is still daylight enough to go there. Then, dear Karayana, have the state carriages prepared. Let us go and see the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. Yes, sire, he replied. When the state carriages were prepared, he informed the king, sire, the state carriages are ready for you. You may go at your convenience. Then King Pasenadi mounted a state carriage and accompanied by the other carriages set out from Nagaraka towards the Sakyan town of Medalumpa. He arrived there while it was still daylight and proceeded towards the park. He went thus as far as the road was passable for carriages, and then he dismounted from his carriage and entered the park on foot. Now on that occasion, a number of bhikkhus were walking up and down in the open, and doing their walking meditation. Then King Pasenadi went to them and asked, Venerable Sirs, where is he living now, the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened? We want to see the Blessed One. That is his dwelling, great king, with the closed door. Go up to it quietly, without hurrying. Enter the porch, clear your throat, and tap on the panel. The Blessed One will open the door for you. King Pasenadi handed over his sword and turban to Diga Karayana, then and there. Then Diga Karayana thought, so the king is going into secret session, and I have to wait here alone. Without hurrying, King Pasenadi went quietly up to the dwelling with a closed door, entered the porch, cleared his throat and tapped on the panel. The Blessed One opened the door. 
Then King Fusenadi entered the dwelling, prostrating himself with his head at the Blessed One's feet. He covered the Blessed One's feet with kisses and caressed them with his hands, pronouncing his name, I am King Fusenadi of Kosala, Venerable Sir. I am King Fusenadi of Kosala, Venerable Sir. But great king, what reason do you see for doing such supreme honor to this body and for showing such friendship? Venerable Sir, I infer according to Dhamma about the Blessed One. The Blessed One is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way. Now, Venerable Sir, I see some recluses and Brahmins leading a limited holy life for ten years, twenty years, thirty or forty years, and then on a later occasion I see them well-groomed and well-anointed with trimmed hair and beards, enjoying themselves provided and endowed with the five cords of sensual pleasure. That means pleasant sights, pleasant sounds, pleasant tastes, pleasant touches, etc. But here I see bhikkhus leading the perfect and pure holy life as long as life and breath last. Indeed, I do not see any other holy life elsewhere as perfect and pure as this. This is why, Venerable Sir, I infer according to Dhamma about the Blessed One, this Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way. Again, Venerable Sir, kings quarrel with kings, nobles with nobles, Brahmins with Brahmins, householders with householders, mother quarrels with son, son with mother, father with son, son with father. Brother quarrels with brother, brother with sister, sister with brother, friend with friend. But here I see bhikkhus living in concord, with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. I do not see any other assembly elsewhere with such concord. This too, Venerable Sir, is why I infer according to Dhamma about the Blessed One. The Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way. So you imagine a king at uh, 80 years has had a lot of experience of society on many levels, and he really notices this harmony and uh, peaceful cohabitation of the Sangha. Again, Venerable Sir, I have walked and wandered from park to park and from garden to garden. There I have seen some recluses and Brahmins who are lean, wretched, unsightly, jaundiced, with veins standing out on their limbs, such that people would not want to look at them again. I have thought, surely these Venerable Ones are leading the holy life in discontent, or they have done some evil deed and are concealing it. So lean and wretched they are, such that people would not want to look at them again. I went up to them and asked, Why are you, Venerable Ones, so lean and wretched, such that people would not want to look at you again? Their reply was, It is our family sickness, Great King. But here I see bhikkhus smiling and cheerful, sincerely joyful, plainly delighting their faculties fresh, living at ease, unruffled, subsisting on what others give, abiding with mind as aloof as a wild deer's. I have thought, surely these Venerable Ones perceive successive states of lofty distinction in the Blessed One's dispensation. Since they abide thus smiling and cheerful, with mind as aloof as a wild deer's, this too, Venerable Sir, is why I infer according to Dhamma about the Blessed One. The Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way. So I think I can ask you just to look to your right, and you can see a group of Theravadan forest monks. I'm not sure if they have progressive stages of lofty realization, but I think we can see there's a radiance, isn't there? There's a composure. When bhikkhus keep the vinaya and practice meditation, are mindful and circumspect, we can see 2,500 years later, because of the Buddha's wisdom in laying down his training rules, the monks uh, are inspiring to look at. And you can compare them to the fake Indian monks that were waiting for donations in front of the Buddhist kuti. And there is a difference, isn't there? <laughs> we won't dwell on that, though. <laughs> so the king, with his powers of observation, was able to see the radiant, serene faces, the result of practice. Again, Venerable Sir, being a head-anointed noble king, I am able to have executed those who should be executed, to find those who should be fined, to exile those who should be exiled, 
Yet, when I am sitting in council, they break in and interrupt me. Though I say, gentlemen, do not break in and interrupt me when I am sitting in council. Wait till the end of my speech. Still, they break in and interrupt me. But here I see bhikkhus, while the Blessed One is teaching the Dhamma to an assembly of several hundred followers, and then there is not even the sound of a disciple of the Blessed One coughing or clearing his throat. Once the Blessed One was teaching the Dhamma to an assembly of several hundred followers, and there a disciple of his cleared his throat. Thereupon, one of his companions in the holy life nudged him with his knee to indicate, Be quiet, Venerable Sir, make no noise. The Blessed One, the teacher, is teaching the Dhamma. I thought, it is wonderful, it is marvelous, how an assembly can be so well disciplined without force or weapon. Indeed, I do not see any other assembly elsewhere so well disciplined. This too, Venerable Sir, is why I infer, according to Dhamma about the Blessed One, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way. Again, Venerable Sir, I have seen here certain learned nobles who were clever, knowledgeable about the doctrines of others, as sharp as hair-splitting marksmen. They wander about, as it were, demolishing the views of others with their sharp wits. When they hear the recluse Gautama will visit such and such a village or town, they formulate a question thus. We will go to the recluse Gautama and ask him this question. If he is asked like this, he will answer like this, and so we will refute his doctrine in this way. And if he is asked like that, he will answer like that, and so we will refute his doctrine in that way. They hear the recluse Gautama has come to visit such and such a village or town. They go to the Blessed One, and the Blessed One instructs, urges, arouses, and gladdens them with a talk on the Dhamma. After they have been instructed, urged, roused, and gladdened by the Blessed One with a talk on the Dhamma, they do not so much as ask him the question. So how should they refute his doctrine? In fact, they become his disciples. This too, Venerable Sir, is why I infer, according to Dhamma about the Blessed One, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way. Then King Pasenadi says, again, Venerable Sir, I have seen here certain learned Brahmins. Again, I have seen certain learned householders. Again, I have seen certain learned recluses. They come up with their question to refute Lord Buddha's teachings. They approach the Buddha. The king has noticed. They do not so much as ask him the question. So how could they refute his doctrine? In actual fact, they ask the Blessed One to allow them to go forth from the home life into homelessness, and he gives them the going forth. Not long after they have thus gone forth, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent and resolute, by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge, they here and now enter upon and abide in that supreme goal of the holy life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. They say thus, We were very nearly lost. We were very nearly perished. For formerly we claimed that we were recluses, though we were not really recluses. We claimed that we were Brahmins, though we were not really Brahmins. We claimed that we were Arahants, though we were not really Arahants. But now we are recluses, now we are Brahmins, now we are Arahants. This too, Venerable Sir, is why I infer, according to Dhamma about the Blessed One, the Blessed One is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way. Now imagine that Lord Buddha spent 18 rains retreats here in the Jetavana and several more in nearby monasteries and the king has been the king that whole time. So during that time he's seen these prominent Brahmins, prominent teachers, prominent householders, many of them with doubts, coming up with the ways that they were going to find fault with Lord Buddha's teaching and he's observed that not only did they not find fault, they actually ordained and then within not very long sometimes weeks, sometimes months, possibly some, in some cases years, those very people who were going to find fault actually became enlightened disciples of the Blessed Way. So the king has had a lot of opportunity to witness uh, many people going forth and many people becoming liberated in his very kingdom. And so he's very moved by this. Again, Venerable Sir, Isidatta and Purana, my two inspectors, eat my food and use my carriages. I provide them with a livelihood and bring them fame. 
Yet despite this, they do not do such honor to me as they do to the Blessed One. Once when I had gone out leading an army and was testing these inspectors, Isidata and Purana, I happened to put up in very cramped quarters. Then these two inspectors, Isidata and Purana, after spending much of the night in talk on the Dhamma, lay down with their heads in the direction where they had heard the Blessed One was staying, and with their feet towards me. I thought, it is wonderful, it is marvelous. These two inspectors, Isidata and Purana, eat my food and use my carriages. I provide them with a livelihood and bring them fame. Yet, in spite of this, they are less respectful towards me than they are towards the Blessed One. Surely these good people perceive successive states of lofty distinction in the Blessed One's dispensation. This too, Venerable Sir, is why I infer, according to Dhamma about the Blessed One, the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way. So that's extraordinary, isn't it? Two of the king's most important staff placing their feet in the king's direction because they wanted to place their head in the direction of the Buddha. It's also wonderful and marvelous that the king is tolerant and humble and uh, doesn't mind so much. He obviously agrees. Again, Venerable Sir, the Blessed One is a noble and I am a noble. The Blessed One is a Kosalan and I am a Kosalan. The Blessed One is 80 years old and I am 80 years old. Since that is so, I think it proper to do such supreme honor to the Blessed One and to show such friendship. And now, Venerable Sir, we depart. We are busy and have much to do. You may go, Great King, at your own convenience. Then King Vasenadi of Kosala arose from his seat and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right, he departed. Then soon after he had left, the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, before rising from his seat and departing, this King Pasenadi uttered monuments to the Dhamma. Learn the monuments to the Dhamma, bhikkhus, master the monuments to the Dhamma, remember the monuments to the Dhamma. The monuments to the Dhamma are beneficial bhikkhus and they belong to the fundamentals of the holy life. That was what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. This is also very revealing, that last paragraph. This is how the bhikkhus studied in the time of the Buddha. They were told a list, usually, of dhammas or a progression of teaching, and then they committed it to memory. We didn't have written texts for some centuries before they were written down, so the monks were very diligent. That's called the Monuments to the Dhamma, and that's how it came to us today, because those monks did commit it to memory and they did recite. This is the conversation that King Pasenadi had with the Buddha. So here we have a teaching actually offered by the king, isn't it? It's, a, it's the teaching by King Pasenadi about from coming from his powers of observation, inspiring behavior that he'd seen uh, in the Buddha's person and in the Buddha's disciples and in those who were suspicious of finding fault with the Buddha who later became his disciples. You remember that also happened in Rajkia? Remember the Kasapa brothers? And remember the Lord, the Lord Buddha, was, uh, he went away he was trying to show them that he was uh, the teacher, really an arahant, and uh, Kasapa was having his annual offering, and so he uh, flew away to the Himalayas for the day, if I recall, had his lunch by a lake, and then came back, and uh, eventually Kasapa realized that the Buddha was superior, and his 500 matted hair fire worshipping ascetics as long as, as well as those of his two brothers went forth under the Buddha and the Magadans, remember? The people from Magadha, from Rajkia, were wondering when the when the Buddha came into Rajkia, is is Mr. Kasapa a disciple of the Buddha or is the Buddha a disciple of and then Kasapa explained that he indeed is a disciple of the Buddha and he got up and he bowed to him. So this is the kind of thing that kings would definitely notice, isn't it? Great teachers with large followings actually becoming students of Lord Buddha and then enlightened disciples of Lord Buddha. So I just thought I'd share that, a little glimpse into the, into the depth to which the Buddha's teachings uh, must have affected these kingdoms. It must have been really extraordinary that the king is kissing the Buddha's feet and uh, considering him a dear friend, going for a ref refuge that the king's ministers sleep with their heads to the, towards the direction of the Buddha. We will talk a little later about Anattapindika and also about Wisaka. Wisaka built another large monastery not far from here, 
I think it had 500 rooms, and uh, Wisaka also had food made available for traveling monks coming and going from Sawati, for Sikh monks, bathing cloths, many services Wisaka offered to the Sangha. You see we had this beautiful synergistic teamwork of great disciples of the Buddha, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, and also great lay disciples that were enabling, empowering, supporting this uh, revolutionary wave of enlightenment here in Savati. Many thousands of bhikkhus, I suspect thousands of bhikkhunis, many tens of thousands of lay people would have attained to levels of enlightenment right here in this vicinity. No doubt they'd built auspicious karmas together for hundreds and thousands of lifetimes before that they could all come and be born and practice and live in this area. Some of us may have lived in the area. And uh, I recently was visiting in Thailand a senior monk in Chiang Rai. And he had, had said that, I won't mention any names, but the two lay women who I was with, he had said had lived in the Savati area, I recall, but were farming or salespeople? Salespeople, okay. They were busy making a living. So they had faith in the Buddha and they put alms food in the bowls of the monks in the area, but they were very busy with their livelihood, so they might not have made the time available to come and listen to the teaching. So it's possible that some of us have made auspicious karma in, in this area. Now we get to come back, consider the teachings. Now that we have a bit of spare time, making that time available to consider the Four Noble Truths, cultivate the Four Foundations of Mindfulness and set the aspiration to realize the deathless. Some people didn't hear, we did a formal declaration or expression of respect and gratitude just before and some people asked me to repeat what I had said basically. Um, should we just do it again? It's a good thing to do, I think. I think we have time. Yeah, we have time. <coughs> The Buddha's kuti is just behind me, so we're facing the Lord Buddha's kuti. It was called the Ganda kuti because it was always fragrant. Ganda means fragrant. Whether the Buddha was there or not, with his merit or his barami, perhaps the devas were offering celestial fragrances and humans could smell them as well. I have to try to remember exactly what I said. Homage to the blessed. Noble, Noble and, perfectly and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed. Homage to the blessed. Noble, Noble and perfectly enlightened one. And perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed. Homage to the blessed. Noble, Noble and perfectly enlightened one. And perfectly enlightened one. We, offer our deep respects we offer our deep respects at this most sacred, this most sacred site of Lord Buddha's Kuti in the Jetavana, Anatta Pindika's Park, Savati. We also formally express our deep appreciation and gratitude for all of the wonderful teachings that Lord Buddha gave in this very place. We also recollect with deep appreciation Lord Buddha's disciples who practice rightly, practice correctly, and their disciples who practice rightly and correctly, right down to our current teachers, we recognize that we have indeed benefited greatly from the enormous wisdom, boundless compassion, and incredible efforts of the Mahabodhisattva who became Lord Buddha. Once again, we express our res respects, our gratitude, and our appreciation. Having offered our respects and gratitude, we also now take the opportunity to ask forgiveness for if there have been any actions of body, speech or mind which were unskillful performed 
regarding the Buddha, the Dhamma or the Sangha, either intentionally or unintentionally, knowingly or unknowingly, in this life or in previous lives. We acknowledge fault humbly, we ask for forgiveness. Through the power of this, expression of respect, gratitude, giving rise to feelings of appreciation and asking for forgiveness. May we never be separated from the teachings of Buddhas and their disciples. May we always come in touch with the true, most sacred, liberating, holy Buddha Dhamma. May we always come under the care of Buddhas or their well-practiced disciples and never be separated from the true teaching. May we live within the container of virtue, concentration and mental cultivation, weakening the powers of greed, hatred and delusion, strengthening the power of sila, samadhi and panya, progressing, never regressing, progressing in the Holy Buddha Dhamma in stages until we go beyond every type of suffering. May we realize the deathless as Lord Buddha and the Arahants and the great disciples did before us. We dedicate the merit of this aspiration to our teachers, relatives, friends, ancestors and all beings karmically connected either through wholesome or unwholesome deeds. For whatever beings we have harmed, knowingly or unknowingly, we ask their forgiveness, understanding that we have been acting under the influence of greed, hatred and delusion. Please accept our apology Please offer your forgiveness as we offer forgiveness to you. May all beings only ever think of benefiting one another. May all beings be well. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free from suffering. May they know in time, according to conditions, complete freedom from every type of suffering, may all beings realize the deathless. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.